mammals and agnathans do not have ultimo branchial quill. <laughs> ultimo branchial. When the nervous system communicates with its effector organs, the response is almost immediate. But what if the body needs these responses to turn out much slower, but last longer? That's a specialty of the endocrine system. Hindi lahat ng bagay minamadali, kaya may hormones. The endocrine glands are blobs of tissue scattered all over the vertebrate body that send out their unique set of messages to their target organs via the bloodstream. And by target, we don't mean... But more of... Uy, pre, ano yun? Ewan ko rin. Para kanino ba yun? Para sa akin yan. I am Batman. While all your organs get bathed with these hormone messages, the only organs that have the receptors for the hormones will actually understand the message and respond accordingly. Before we dive into the different endocrine glands and their functions, Crash Course, as usual, will provide us with the basic components and terminologies related to the endocrine system, as well as a few examples of how different endocrine glands communicate with one another. Hormones come in two basic structural types. Fat-based hormones are secreted by the mesodermally derived glands and protein-based hormones come from glands that arose from the ectoderm or endoderm. The way they are welcomed into their cells are also different. As I've mentioned, glands are the organs that produce and secrete hormones. We will work our way from head to tail starting with the hypothalamus, which is part of the diencephalon. It has roles in maintaining internal homeostasis, social behaviors, and alertness. Once it receives stimuli from other parts of the brain, its neurosecretory cells secrete tropic hormones to the hypophysis. The hypophysis is the two-part endocrine gland hanging from the floor of the brain. It's like your brain's balls. <laughs> As in, diba? Parang mukha talaga may bayag yung utak. The neurohypophysis arises from the floor of the diencephalon. Its structure mainly varies due to the depth of the third ventricle. In mammals, the third ventricle is so deep to the point that the floor of the diencephalon gets drawn out into an infundibular stalk with a lobe at the distal portion. It doesn't produce hormones, but instead stores, then releases what comes from the hypothalamus. Some hormones released by the neurohypothesis include arginine vasotocin, which in our case that would be vasopressin, and oxytocin. I guess this is a good time to segue that the more popular name for the hypothesis is the pituitary gland. That has something to do with the origin of its other half, the adenohypophysis. This part embryonically arises from the roof of the stomodium suggesting that its secretions were primitively intended for the oral cavity. And one of these secretions was surmised to be the phlegm. And they were dead wrong about that. Pituitary. The pars intermedia secretes MSH, which regulates pigmentation. Although absent in birds and some mammals, MSH-producing cells were found in the pars distalis, which produces these hormones. Many of which go on to affect the other glands further down the hormonal cascade. Pars tuberalis can only be found in tetrapods and is said to mediate photoperiodic release of prolactin in seasonal mammals. The pineal gland releases melatonin when it's dark out. And this sort of completes the picture of what the median eyes are for. Melatonin is important for regulating our daily biological clocks and sleep cycles. The adrenal gland in mammals has two major parts, the medulla and the cortex. The kidney-associated glands of other craniates may not have distinct partitions as in ours. So, in the spirit of inclusivity, we call the tissues that secrete the protein-based hormones aminogenic tissues or chromaffin bodies. And the tissues that secrete the lipid-based hormones are the steroidogenic tissues. Aminogenic tissues secrete the famous adrenaline and noradrenaline, responsible for the flight or fight response. The release of these hormones should be quick, hence the adrenal medulla is directly connected to the nervous system. 
Steroidogenic tissues, on the other hand, are regulated by hormones or other hormone-like substances circulating in the bloodstream. They secrete glucocorticoids that play roles in blood sugar, salt, and stress regulation, and mineralocorticoids that also regulate salt and ultimately blood pressure. The gonads are the other set of steroidogenic tissues in craniates and produce hormones associated with the distinct biological characteristics of males and females, be they morphological, physiological, and or behavioral. All craniates have progesterone, which is needed to produce corticosteroids and androgens, which in turn are needed to produce estrogens. Now, the mother of all of these really is cholesterol. Of the various secretions of the gonads, only relaxin is protein-based. Mammalian ovaries produce this right before giving birth to help soften the ligaments in the pelvic girdle. These next four glands arise from the pharyngeal pouches. Remember the endostyle? It now makes its debut as a thyroid gland. Thyroid hormones regulate vital life processes in vertebrates such as metabolism, growth, metamorphosis, molting, reproduction. Typically, the release of more thyroid hormones stimulate these processes, except in amphibians, where more thyroid hormones means less sexy time. The parathyroid and ultimobranchial glands are like the two siblings constantly fighting over blood calcium levels. Whereas the parathyroid stimulate calcium release into the blood, the ultimobranchials don't want them around. Mammals and agnathans do not have ultimobranchial glands, but in mammalian development, certain pharyngeal pouches produce calcitonin cells, which make their way to the thyroid gland to become the parafollicular cells that do the calcitonin secretion. Keeping a regulated supply of calcium is important to ensure that bones remain strong. <laughs> Eggshells are durable and muscles don't spasm uncontrollably. Fishes do not have the parathyroid, but they regulate calcium levels in their bodies via the somatolactin hormone produced by the hypophysis. And they also mobilize calcium from their scales instead of their bones. The thymus and the bursa of Fabricius in birds are responsible for T lymphocyte production and maturation. In birds and mammals, this is only really present in juveniles as it is crucial to establish an immune system before pathogens start feasting on your babies. The pancreas releases hormones that mediate the release and uptake of nutrients to and from the cells. How about the gastrointestinal tract? It's considered a secondary endocrine organ because they also secrete hormones that either regulate the release of digestive enzymes or alter the pH of the stomach content so that the digestive enzymes can work properly. How about the kidneys? Also a secondary endocrine organ, and it releases renin to increase the blood pressure. And we all know how important it is to maintain proper blood pressure. If it's too high, your blood vessels could burst. If it's too low, might not have enough oxygen delivered to your cells, and then you're like... <coughs> and that's a rundown of most of the hormones of the vertebrate body. Needless to say, you can bet that there is a hormone for just about anything that happens in the animal body. One thing to always keep in mind is that while almost all craniates more or less have the same hormones, these may perform slightly different functions depending on the taxon you are studying. While we were able to discuss a few of them, we've barely scratched the surface, so please, please, please read your references to know more. I hope you've also noticed the cyclical nature of hormone release. This has a lot to do with the cyclical nature of the rest of the universe. Changes in photoperiods, seasons, rainfall are detected by the sense organs, which then kickstart the hormonal cascade from the hypothalamus. So when the seasons change, the abundance of food also changes. You want to make sure you are responding to these changes accordingly. Like in the business of baby making, for example, raising offspring right smack in the dead of winter is a waste of precious energy. And it's an insult to the intelligence of the universe as a whole. Quotable quotes, you are an insult to the intelligence of the universe as a whole. The bottom line is the endocrine system is a slower sibling of the nervous system. It acts on a stimulus, but its effects often kick in much later, although they last longer and may affect many tissues all at once 
but sometimes in different ways. If you want to know more, as usual, here are a few more videos to help you get to know more about the endocrine system, and I will see you in the next one. Bakit hindi mo ko type? Because you're not acute stress. <laughs>